Jim White died last night. Oh, yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a very sad situation. So it's a, at any rate, we need to keep Rick, Vic, Vicky in our prayers, and that's going to be a tough, tough time. They had they had put money down and bought a house in Abilene because that's where her 97 year old mother is, and they canceled all those plans when Jim got sick. And uh, uh, Vicky may follow through with that now. That you know, but, but um, at any rate, very very sad situation right now. It's just just heartbreaking. I got good news from Dale that that, that Robert's doing better. Good. Dale thought she would be here today, so we'll see. And I'm hoping that Linda Gelzer is here later today. She is about this close. If she hadn't gotten a job, she's about that close to it. So good. So, so it's where, very, where is uh, Robert now? What's that? Where is Robert? Now? He is at Presby North Presbyterian North. Yeah. They moved him from Baylor Plano to get yeah. from. We saw Robert Friday evening, and he had such a wonderful attitude mm -hmm. and was very frail. But he said, I'm going home either to my house or to my heavenly home. Yes. And it doesn't matter to me. Yes, yes. <laughs> He's had such a strong faith. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, let's go through our church wide announcements then and um, give Terry as much time as we can here. Okay. Um, on uh, today after church, uh, there'll be a box, free box lunch and um, and a viewing of To Whom It May Concern. It's a video. Uh, that this is Wilshire in 3D, and this is a um, thing. I think some people are going to want to see. Uh, Laura, oh, I don't want to do it. Laura's got a BBS meeting, but um, you also can watch it at home. Hey, Dale, want you tell us how your dad's doing? He's he's actually um, doing pretty well. He's in Presbyterian Village North. Um, in That's skilled cool. nursing, so he's getting up for us in Greenville, so it's close to his house and close to my house, and he's, he's getting physical therapy and OT, and he's actually, I mean, I saw him yesterday, and he, he, yeah, I think he's back in a routine, he's sleeping, and, you know, so he's actually... I'm going to see him after. That's good. That's good. Well, like keep us posted food. on that. He doesn't like the food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's had tons of visitors, so he really wants to visit. Okay. Fantastic. Good news on that. Um, okay. Today, um, the Dean of Wake Forest, uh, Wake Forest Divinity School, Dean Ray Hill, will be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's going to be here to talk to us. He's uh, next Sunday we start lunches after church. I think that's going to be a good thing to do. To uh, it's going to be uh, ten dollars a person um, and a family limit, of, you know, so it doesn't get too high. So anyway, that's um, starting on that's on page eleven. Let's see. I don't know. Advanced reservation and payment through the realm are not required. But encouraged to help the staff plan. Okay. So if you can forecast as you're coming and pay ahead of time, that'd be a good thing. Okay. Um, Passport uh, to Peace, VBS, is, is June 13 through 17, and I, I didn't send on last Sunday afternoon the link to be, to the sign-up genius, but I did send it on Wednesday night. So there's a link there to go if you want to bring some food or whatever, and it tells you where you bring to the church office the day before or whatever, or put the refrigerator down there or tell them where it is, mark VBS on it. Um, that's, um, and there are also some volunteers needed on page 12. George is to be honored on page 13, uh, a, di a dialogue dinner honoring George Mason on June 15th in Richardson. Um, so that's there. And this is uh, the page 14 and 15 are uh, kind of Tim Morgan, and it sounds like he's interviewing Doug Haney on uh, can we avoid a seasonal slowdown in the summer? So we'll so that's on page 14 and 15. General Assembly of Texas on June 18 through 30 on page 16. Uh, Britt McClung is, um, is, is on uh, page 17 is our Iron Wilshire. And I think that's it. Summer schedules are on 19. And I believe that's pretty much it. Any other church-wide announcements that uh, we need to go through? <coughs> I, know, I, know, I don't know if Jerry's going to be able to join us. She was helping with the choir stuff. And Diana got, is, is again, I think, she, I think we're going to see her in September. But she's down in the, in the 
in the children's area again. So um, we'll see how that goes. At any rate, let's. Uh, well, I know, Jer, I, she was planning on coming because I saw her when she came in. She just didn't know that she would get here. Yeah. So she may not make it. <laughs> we know how that goes. Yeah. One more thing. That's right. Well, first off, thank y'all for letting me come for three weeks in a row. Uh, I don't thank normally you. sign up for that uh, because. Um, hi. Uh, were your ears burning? But these three topics were such that I just couldn't resist. Uh, uh, signing up. So anyway, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as usual, I've stolen from many different sources, but two that I would like to mention this morning. Uh, one is a book by, that Mike Caps has been doing a four-week study with in various Sunday school classes called Borders and Belongings, and it's by an Irish poet and uh, 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 together, he and Glenn Jordan were doing seminars across Ireland trying to deal uh, with peop the anger that was going along with Brexit. Uh, and so that was one book. The other one, uh, Amy Clark Souls is an SMU professor mm -hmm. and the Interpretations Commentary has just published within the last year uh, her commentary on women in the Bible. So uh, I also use some stuff from her. Uh, two Sundays ago I talked about how the Babylonian captivity led to the development of the Old Testament. There were thousands of scrolls available for people, but they needed to be edited into a text as Tomlinson called it, a Bible that would help the Jews renew and maintain their covenant with God. Uh, so the Old Testament emerges from the exile period. The Torah, the first five books, were actually done in exile. Uh, and so that, to help them rebuild the society. Uh, and we know the prophets were were developed after that, and the prophets continually called the people uh, to be loyal to God's concern for all people, and his judgment on the Jewish people, especially the leaders, <coughs> came because they were not offering justice and mercy, uh, not only to the less fortunate Jews, but to anyone who needed help. <coughs> and you know, last week we looked at Jonah. He's a prophet, but he is so human. <laughs> and he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Why? Because he knew God would show mercy and justice to these people. And he just wasn't sure that was something he wanted to happen. And, and you know, we talked about there were valid reasons for him feeling that way. But the interesting thing as we move in today, just keep this in mind, Jonah was an immigrant to Nineveh. Maybe he was just a tourist. Maybe, you know, he obviously didn't want to live there, but he was the outsider coming in. And he gets a very positive response from those people. Uh, and then, of course, we have the writings that offer the history and, and the wisdom literature. Ruth is, falls into the history category. She lived during the time of Judges, but this is obviously a post-exile book because it tells you she was the great-grandmother of David, <laughs> you know. Uh, so obviously it was written much later or pulled together much later and then those references uh, to David put in. Uh, one of the things about the book of Jonah and the book of Ruth that the scholars seem to agree on is that they were to counteract the excessive nationalism and religious exclusivity of Ezra and Nehemiah. And you know, I looked through the uh, list of lessons and I didn't see Ezra and Nehemiah. <laughs> and 
there's probably a reason for that, you know, because uh, one ag action in Ezra that would be very pertinent to Ruth is that when, uh, when the exiles went home, well, the, a lot of them had married foreign wives, and the ones who had stayed there had married foreign wives. And all of a sudden, they decide, the Jewish men decide, they got to send all those foreign women away. They sent their foreign wives and their children away so that they then would be free, I guess, to marry Jewish women. Uh, conversion didn't seem to be an option at this time. And of course, as one commentary uh, pointed out, this action totally disregarded the extremely important acts done for Jews by foreign women like Tamar, Rehab, and Ruth, you know. So we, we have these books standing really in the Old Testament saying, once again, God loves everybody, you know, and he wants to be in relationship with everybody. Uh, so today's lesson, I don't know if y'all read uh, the lesson description for today, but this is what it says. Um, today's lesson raises the difficulties faced by immigrants, particularly women. And here's the blurb from, from the lesson handout, that the whole thing that y'all have. Ruth was a Moabite woman who married Boaz and was welcomed into the faith of Israel. She became the great-grandmother of David, as in, and, and I added this, is in the lineage of Jesus recorded in Matthew. We see God's purpose worked out through hesed, or loyalty, of two immigrant women, Ruth and Naomi. What does such love for aliens mean for us today, particularly in the debate over illegal immigration? So there's a lot there. Um, First off, do you think of Ruth and Naomi as immigrants? Have you ever couched them in terms of being immigrants? Naomi is an immigrant to Moab, and Ruth is going to be an immigrant uh, to Judah or Israel. Do uh, you think about that? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when you think about these women, um, how do you describe them? Well, obviously they're women, and we know in that time they were at a disadvantage because of law and custom. What else were they? They were sort of at the mercy of society. They were at the mercy of society. They were widows, not good. They were childless, even worse. If nothing else, children allowed a woman some level of status and security in these clan societies. Uh, and of course, Naomi is a foreigner when she's in Moab, and Ruth is a foreigner when she returns. Um, so both of these women uh, have all of these strikes against them, so to speak. Uh, most of you are familiar with the, this story, but maybe we should review it a, a little bit. Uh, by the way, before I forget it, uh, help me with your name. Kay. Kay, I'm sorry. I'm terrible. Uh, Kay uh, told me this morning, and I asked her if she wanted to share it, but she said she'd let me. Uh, Ruth is a book that is read at Shavuot. It's the festival of Pentecost. And they read the law, which has been the source of a lot of nationalism and exclusivity. And guess what other book they read? Ruth. And so you have a real contrast in, in these, two book, these two books that are read at this festival, which I think s speaks volumes to this message of how God is not exclusive in his love, in, in his wanting to be in a relationship. Um, 
Now, I will say this. Whoever, Jonah and Ruth are both wonderful masterpieces of short story writings. So whoever these redactors were who put these stories together, they were good writers. And uh, both of them are just four chapters long. And uh, Amy Clark uh, Souls says that it, this book really should have been called Naomi and Ruth. <laughs> because it, it, Naomi is the catalyst character in it. She makes things happen because she knows the rules of the culture. Ruth doesn't. Uh, so you really have to see her while she's not, the book's not named after her, she is obviously almost the main character. And Ruth and Boaz, in a sense, uh, stand in her shadow in the sense that whatever happens between them happens because of Naomi. So we, we would call her a catalyst character. Uh, Ruth is really the tool for solving their problem. Uh, resolving uh, what it means to be marginalized by this society. So anyway, uh, Boaz is a model of integrity in the way he uses his power. Uh, in chapter 2, uh, two first one, verse 1, he's called a man of worth. And then in chapter 3, verse 11, he calls Ruth a woman of worth. So when you're looking at it, you're almost getting a sense of equality about the ethical uh, nature of these two people. So we have the central problem in chapter 1. Uh, the family, Naomi's family has gone uh, to Moab, and now all three men are dead. Uh, and there's this, this conversation about fullness and barrenness, and it's, she, she left with everything and she comes back with nothing. Uh, and we're going to see this barrenness, fullness imagery. Did you, you know, have you noticed how much of that is in, in this story? So she decides to go back. Uh, let's read uh, chapter 1, 19 through 22. Would someone read that? So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me? And the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Through 22? Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, so Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the, fair, of the barley harvest. Okay, one of the commentaries, do you know what the word Bethlehem means? House of bread or house, house of, of bread. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the town reacts to it. You know, not only has Naomi come back, but she's brought this daughter-in-law with her. You know, I don't know about you, but if somebody comes back, we live in a big city, but if you lived in a small town and someone went away and came back, you're always like, why did they come back? <laughs> you know, what's going on here? You know, and so, so they were kind of stirred up, and it might have been, well, yeah, they went away rich, and she has come back poor. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but I think here, what you, do you hear echoes of Job and what... Naomi is saying, everything lost. Everything lost. Yeah. And, and to some degree, uh, one of the things that we have to think about here is how easily it is to slip into a transactional relationship with God. God does for me and I do for God. It's not based on any kind of relationship other than this transactional thing. I'll do this and God will do this. And that really, if you, that's not what it's all about, in a sense, but it's so easy to slip into that. Uh, now, <clears throat> by the way, they come back at harvest time. 
I would suggest to you, from a literary standpoint, coming back at harvest time may be foreshadowing that they will indeed be able to harvest a life. Uh, the fullness that harvest represents is a possibility in, in this. So sometimes there are little sentences that we read and we don't think much about them, but they, be, they might be hints as to what is coming. Um, by the way, Ruth is a Moabite from Moab. Does it strike? Why? If you, if you remember the book, all through this, it's Ruth from Moab, the Mo, the, Ruth the Moabite from Moab. Why this double emphasis? Uh, why would the writers place such an emphasis on her being from Moab? What do you know about the country? Where was it? Oh, you would. I am so bad at geography. <laughs> <laughs> East of <Eden. laughs> it, It's off. It's off. On the other side of the Dead Sea. Yeah, it's okay. off to, okay. would be the east, right? Yep. It, I'm trying to look at the map. Where more yeah. like is Syria or something is now? No, Syria is more like north, like I Jordan? think. Yeah, Jordan, yeah, like yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, Does but, Moab have a big enemy of theirs in battle or something? Or, I mean, I don't well, know. it was kind of a family thing. Okay. Uh, Lot's daughter-in-law got him drunk and had a child by him, and that was Moab, and he founded this country of, of Moab. Uh, but the problem was, because of stereotypes, how we, the enemy, I'm sure there was struggle, there was conflict between them from time to time, but um, Moabite women were considered uh, seductresses and oversexed. You know, they were just ready to go to bed with anybody. And, uh, and that kind of came out of, apparently, some Jewish soldiers got distracted from their mission by some Moabite women. But anyway, you know, the point is there's a good deal of stereotyping. So not only, I mean, Ruth comes with this sort of background that Moab women are promiscuous. Uh, so we get them here, and uh, of course Ruth goes into the field. Uh, there are key. There's some verses here uh, uh, that tell us a lot about Ruth. How would you describe Ruth's time in the field? It, you know, you're familiar with this story. How does she come across as a human being? Hard worker. Hard work, very hard work. Hungry, maybe, you know. Yeah, yeah. She, obviously she was there to get food. Yeah. She, for, seemed, uh, all, go. And she seems respectful of the yeah. customs. And um, I'm not, uh, the word's not coming to mind, not diminutive, but. Uh, humble. 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 Okay, humble. sure. Yeah, very humble. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you look at 10, verse 10, it says, when, when uh, she's the ideal immigrant in a sense, because uh, she's humble, she's hardworking, she's not asking for very much, just, uh, just food, <laughs> you know, just food. Uh, but in ten, when he comes up, then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? So, uh, we have this, and in verse 11, he responds to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Uh, he is a very... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, he, he's a man of honor. He makes sure that his. You remember he tells her, "Stay with my, stay with my young women," and I've told the young men not to bother you. Uh, so he's very protective of his people. Uh, he's, uh, and and yet with her, 
he recognizes, she, he knows about uh, from, from what he said. And remember, this is clan family time. Uh, this is not just the village talking, which they probably are, but it's also <laughs> what's going on in the family. Because, uh, like, we know that Naomi owns land, quote, unquote, but she doesn't really own it. It belongs. She owns a portion. She has deed, so to speak, to a portion of the family land. So basically, she owns it to the extent a woman can own something. Yeah, exactly. In society, uh, which but, isn't really. Owning. Which it, it, which is not really owning it. Uh, but the interesting thing here is, um, he really presents God as a God of refuge, and he it, notice. Uh, <coughs> and may you have a full reward from God whose wings you have come under for refuge. He has already acknowledged that she, in an essence, is a Jew. I mean, not literally, but she has adopted the God of the Jews. And so he, this is another step here that makes her a little less an immigrant, in a, in a sense. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> So, uh, uh, we know, we know because we know the story, all the cultural background, and Naomi has already told us, you know, this tradition of the brother where, marrying, taking the widow for a wife, or some man in the family taking the widow as a wife, and, and it's not going to be Naomi because she's too old to have kids. Uh, and that's what it, for a woman, that's what it's all about, is having kids. Uh, that, that cements their position in society. So uh, we get to three, and it offers the, uh, the apex of tension. Now, do we need to go over what happened on the threshing room floor? Do you all remember? Naomi sends her under cover of night. Uh, remember, anybody want to summarize it? <laughs> or do we remember what all went on? Naomi gets her dressed up, yeah. sends her to the threshing floor uh -huh. to meet with Boaz in whatever sense they meet. I <laughs> kind of go back and forth because yeah. it's sort of a double entendre. Yeah. Right? And uh, uh, she stays the night with him, whatever that means, mm -hmm. and then he sends her back um, at, at, you know, before it's light enough for anybody to recognize someone else at a distance. Well, it's still yeah. dark. Or recognize him. Oh, okay. Both. Sure. It, it's both. Sure. But, uh, yeah, and so we get this. And, and the scholars will, you know, the scholars uh, seem divided on exactly what happened on the threshing room floor. The word cloak gets used a lot, which is symbolic of let's keep things under cover until it's time to reveal everything, so to speak. But uh, there are some words in there. <clears throat> Let's just say the word feet does not mean feet in some Jewish interpretations. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> Explain that, Terry. <laughs> I'm a little naive. She slept at, his, uh, at the foot of the bed. Well, in, in <clears throat> some Jewish yeah. text, it, it meant male genitals. Okay. Feet. I did male not know genitals. that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. I, I, I was afraid I wasn't going to offer any. We're sitting here thinking, we, we just keep saying, I didn't know that. I, didn't know that. <laughs> I read this. Thank you. Yeah. But that's, that's why the scholars debate did they really mean feet or is this a euphemism? Did they have sex or didn't they? You know. Um, and the whole deal of how much barley he gave her, was she already pregnant? Was she impregnated that night? So, you know, those aren't, those aren't questions the scholars really are prepared to answer. They just put it out there for you. Now, um, I, I thought it was interesting that Boaz does not, he is a man of honor. He does not take advantage of the young women who are working for him. So he doesn't want to be recognized either. And so we, we get to 
uh, back to 18, and of course Naomi says, okay, we just wait. It's out of our hands now. Boaz has to take care of things. And of course he does. Uh, he offers Naomi's land to the next kinsman. The guy wants it right up until the moment he finds out he has to take Ruth as a wife. And then it's like, no, don't think so. And uh, so Boaz and uh, marries Ruth and they have a child uh, who has a child who has David. And then, of course, we know the lineage goes all the way to Jesus and Matthew. But the Baroness image disappears. It is now, you know, full of... Yes? Terry, I'm just wondering, kind of going back to the, to the feet episode, does that play into the stereotype of the Moabite women being oversexed? I, th I think so. Uh, so was I'm not sure. You know, the scholars just leave it kind of like this is what it could mean. Mm -hmm. But obviously, with her being a Moabite woman, there's always that cloud until she is married to Boaz. That cloud of not being possibly. And that's why all of those descriptions of her being a hard worker and taking care of Naomi and all of that, those are all to counteract the, the stereotype that, that we have here. So, you know, as, as we look at this story, um, uh, it really ra raises all of the issues immigrants face. It is a story of immigration. So when you think about some of those things, we've already mentioned economic security, insecurity. We've already talked about how she's out there gleaning in those fields for food, so there's food insecurity. Uh, we, we see the hard work uh, that she puts in in the fields. Uh, and yet we have this other stereotype of promiscuity. So, uh, have you seen any other immigrant issues in here? Well, don't they live in a cave? Naomi and Ruth? I missed that. Well, I'm sorry, maybe I made that up. <laughs> Places in their lives, they feel trapped in caves. Yeah, I mean, uh, you no know, one God could have put Jonah in a cave mm -hmm. as easily as in the belly of the whale. Because, of course, I don't know about y'all. I don't care how big Carlsbad Caverns is. I don't want to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but, but you see what we're getting at here. They they are in a dark place. They're desperate. Um, and no one takes them in. It, the implication is that no one takes them in. You're right. Uh, and certainly no one is giving them food. And they're part of the family. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of goes back to, well, wait, y'all ran off to, when the rest of us were starving, you ran off to Moab, you know, so you could get food. So there is tension here between Naomi and her people, or at least... It's implied tension, right. uh, you know, uh, because if the family had taken them in, Ruth wouldn't be out in the fields. Uh, so we don't know exactly what's going on, but that would suggest some isolation uh, in that. So um, and desperation and desperation. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me. I need to deal with this particular thing uh, in, in the lesson because this probably this may be the most important thing uh, and all y'all are so good at jumping in and everything I appreciate it uh, in the lesson it refers to the word hesed h-e-s-e-d it's sometimes spelled with a c uh, are you familiar with that word 
like the city? No. <coughs> Where does that appear? Well, that's. And sometimes it's got a C. Okay, this may be one of the most important words in the Bible. It appears 250 times in the Old Testament. And it, it expresses an essential part of God's char character. It comes out of a root word that means to bow one's head in courtesy to an equal. And that's what we end up seeing with Boaz and Ruth. And they're real. They become ethical equals in a sense. They are both worthy people. Uh, and they are forming a relationship. It has lots of synonyms. And they are all tied to caring action. Um, to lose Hesed in the Old Testament, Old Testament means to turn to idols whatever those idols are. You know, in our day and time, power, greed, success, selfishness, social status, family, religion, whatever you want to call it. You know, the, the idols are pretty much the same throughout human history. It just depends on what names we give them or whether we build a golden calf to it or not. Um, but that's in Jonah about when you lose Hesed, you turn to idols. Uh, in Jonah 2a. God is the model for Hesed. Uh, and Jesus models it in the New Testament. Now depending on the translation, when God gave Moses the law the second time, he describes himself as abounding in or filled with Hesed. Now depending on translations, you might get love and faithfulness, mm -hmm. unfailing love, faithful mm -hmm. love, st steadfast mm -hmm. love, or loyal love, but probably the the all of the, the the book I was reading said that loving kindness is probably the closest we can come to Hesed, uh, to the full meaning of Hesed. But the core idea of it is that it's a it's it's a it has to do with covenant faithfulness. We make a covenant with God. And we behave in ways that, in loving kindness that show, we make covenants with other people. And we behave in ways that show covenant faithfulness. So that word becomes very central, not only to this lesson, but to a bunch of other lessons. I think the first time I ran into it may have been in Micah, that passage surrounding Micah 6 a. You know, what, oh man, what does God require of you? Uh, uh, so. And are you saying it's here in Ruth? Well, yeah, but not. Well, this, this the is concept of concept. Hesed. Okay. And what we see here is Ruth and Naomi, there's covenant faithfulness in the way oh, right, they right. treat each other. What <clears throat> we're going to see with Boaz as he develops this relationship. It, it's not only covenant faithfulness with God, but it's what we form with other people. But it's all tied to loving kindness of action, that we treat other people uh, the way God would have us treat them. You know, it goes back, uh, Jesus, what are the two great commandments? Love God and love others. And of course, the scripture that bothers me the most that Jesus had to say was in Luke when he asked the question, do you expect to be rewarded for loving the lovable? Even non-believers love the lovable. Mm -hmm. We're not called in covenant faithfulness. We go back to Jonah. You know, he wasn't called to just love Jews. Uh, so this word, you really focus uh, in terms of covenant faithfulness. Uh, and God wants to be in a covenant relationship with everyone. Comments, questions? So does that word appear in the Hebrew text that's translated for us? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, yeah. did, how is, what word is it translated in our... Well, it will be loving kindness. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the translations. Uh, abounding in. Uh, love and faith. Unfailing love. Faithful love. Steadfast love. Loyal love. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but it's more the concept behind this than I'm not sure there's an exact word that I could okay. go to in okay. this. But it is, yeah, it, it's the idea of covenant faithfulness sure. that is at work here in this book. <clears throat> so when we talk about, when we talk about immigrants, um, you know, the lesson question uh, is about, you know, how do we relate to immigrants, to aliens? Let me ask the first question. How often do you think about your ancestors who were immigrants into this country? Well, what? Every day. Every day. Every day, yeah. If you uh, think back, if you ever do any, uh, go down to the library and do some research and find things out, you find the mail order bride. Uh huh. The order in 1640 from England. Yeah. And uh, you find all sorts of, and you find some things that are not what you, you know. I mean, if you go in there and, and think it's all going to be clean and neat, it's not. No. There's an A in there, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the things that, if we're going to try to relate to immigrants and try to show loving kindness, because that's essentially what the lesson question is, you know, how, how do you relate? Uh, uh, when you think about immigrants, um, do you see them coming because we invite them? No. Sometimes. Sometimes. In what ways do we invite them? They're cheap labor. Cheap labor. Mm -hmm. Refugees. Refugees. Uh, and it's interesting because we're more, we have had a tendency as a nation to be more open to some refugees than to other refugees. And how we define a refugee. And how we define refugee, <laughs> exactly. You know, <clears throat> this is an ugly part of our history, but when Jews were trying to escape Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. we turned them away. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we welcomed Cuban refugees with open arms. And you look at the politics of that, you know. Uh, but so, you know, but we do invite them in. Be, uh, and I will tell you, for years, you know, when we talk about immigration laws, uh, the reason, and, and I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I know for years I have heard the farmers and the ranchers, in particular, want immigrant workers mm -hmm. because they will do work that they can't get Americans to do. You know, and the construction companies right now, would anything get built without, in many cases, illegal immigrant workers, especially from from uh, you know South America? Uh, Dennis, I, I've got to tell you, our clock is stuck. Oh, it stopped. It can't oh, make it. it apparently, it sorry. can't make it uphill. You know, this happened to me once before. Oh, yes. It it's, must it's, be the hot air coming. No. <laughs> I had to reset that clock every every Sunday, but right still, it doesn't look like it can make it back uphill. Yeah. Yeah. It's 10:33 right now. Okay. Um, just to quickly uh, we would be rude without this lesson. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to quickly, we would be rude without this lesson. Thank you. Yes. I have a the sign up sheet for if anybody hasn't seen it to go to our Christmas. Our Christmas party. I keep saying <laughs> our, our Sunday school party next Saturday. It's at my brother's place. It's a long way from here. It's an hour and something away from here. So if you can get rides together, if you haven't signed up, please please do. And, and if you don't want to sign up for anything, please come anyway because there's, there's you don't have to fish. You can come sit in the house and talk and play puzzle, do puzzles, play games, whatever. But anyway, it'll just be a fun time to get away. And I'll I'll pass this back around. Patty is is not feeling well today. We're hoping that that she is um, gets better. Let me go through this list. Um, of course, we want to pray for the pastor search committee. And Robert Cung, you know, is getting better. We're so happy to hear that report. And then Jerry Baker um, uh, requested prayer for Byron. How do you pronounce his last name? 
Magoo. Magoo, okay. The father of Dallas Councilman Adam Magoo, and, and Byron has, has had a stroke and a heart attack. And mm -hmm. uh, Jerry works very closely with, with um, Adam um, and his, yes. his, his councilman yes. in Dallas. Yes. For then, six, then, over six years, yes. Yes. And then sadly, Jim White died last night. Oh, so uh, we're so sorry for that. Um, traveling Wednesday for a funeral for an aunt. Uh, this, is this from Vicki? Yes. Uh, her son-in-law to be memorialized today at noon. Uh, died Wednesday morning of a heart attack. So that's for prayer for, for Vicki's family. Ray's sister, Cornelia Walker, who lives in North Carolina, has a variety of health problems. So we'll definitely pray for Cornelia on that one. And Linda, do you have anything to tell us? Yes, quickly. I will be starting some contract work with some with the PR department at Cook Children's this next week. It's just kind of, I don't really know how many hours or what it's going to be, but I'm going to work with them for a while until I find out what I want to do, find something more permanent. And I do have some other um, kind of recruiter people I'm working with. So hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I worked at Cook years ago. Yeah. Cook Children, okay. Uh, let's pray quickly. Thank you so much for, for being here today. And like I say, I've got the list here if anybody wants to add to it. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day and time to read your word and study your scripture. Please be with the pastor search committee as, as they deliberate and start taking input and, and look at resumes. Give them discernment um, and strength and energy to complete their task. We pray for Robert. Help him to continue to get better. We pray for... The, and for Byron Go, for that Jerry has pointed out to us, who has had a heart attack and a stroke, give him strength and energy, and the people taking care of him to to help him. Father, we pray for for Vicky at, at, upon the death of her husband last night, Jim White. Um, give her strength and energy to get through these coming days. <coughs> Father, we pray for Vicky's family, her aunt, um, and her and for her son-in-law who be memorialized at noon. We pray for Ray's sister, Cornelia Walker, um, in North Carolina, as she's facing a variety of, of health problems. Be with her to give her strength, um, and for those who are treating her. Father, we pray a prayer of thanks for Linda uh, for finding work, and hope this, uh, hope this works to be a, um, a good opportunity for her. Father, we pray for Wilshire, for our staff, um, and help us to be your hands and feet in, the, in this part of the world. Let me pray. Amen. Amen. And may I say, I was going to say that Dennis ends prayers with may we be your hands and feet. And that's Hesse. Yes. Uh, <laughs> preferably with loving kindness. Thank you, Jerry. Next time I'm going to I'm sorry. Thank you.